So I guess a, a general overview of what uh, I'd like to cover today, um, laminated veneer lumber or LBL, what it is and, and what it does, uh, portal frames in general, what are the advantages, um, structural forms, connection types. Um, I want to touch on material selection and how it differs from a primary frame perspective, so the portal itself versus the secondary framing that you're likely to have in the same structure. Um, I'll go over some general design guidelines for LBL buildings. Um, and I've got two real building um, design examples to, to run through. Um, one being our, our Marsden Point LBL manufacturing facility and the other, um, another building in Northland, the, the Whangarei Dry Mill. And as part of that, um, I'll, I'll run through some of the software tools we have available for engineers to, to streamline the design process there. And uh, lastly, I've, I've got a couple of slides of, of sort of practical considerations and tips for engineers uh, doing this sort of, of structural design. And um, if we have time at the very end, I've got a few other project examples that, that I can run through some pictures of as well. So I think the mayor's done a pretty good job of, of introduction there. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Future Build LBL, um, we're a manufacturing business that's that's part of the wider Carter Holt Harvey Building Supplies Group. Um, so Carter Holt Harvey also manufactures sawn timber, uh, plywood, and um, and and has a merchant chain as part of the wider group. Um, our, our manufacturing facility is located in Northland at, at Marston Point, and um, all of our products are, are manufactured from uh, renewable plantation radiator pine. So a bit about uh, the, the product itself. Um, we have a pretty broad range of, of different LPL grades available. Um, and, and the modulus of elasticity or, or E there ranges from, from 16 at its highest uh, down to 9.5. Um, hopefully some of these names uh, grade-wise are, are familiar to, to some of you. Um, high, high ones, the, the high E16 there and uh, high 90s, the, the low end of the range. Um, it's important to mention that for these larger structures, um, you're not necessarily restricted to the standard sections and um, standard thicknesses and grades that are available off the shelf, if you like. Um, so we, we can manufacture pretty well any of our grades and any of our standard thicknesses. Um, we have flexibility around what we rip our, uh, our final product dimension to. Um, so it, it's, it's worth noting that we work with a, a 1200 millimeter nominal billet width. Um, so we're always manufacturing a 1200 mil width by whatever thickness we happen to be pressing. And we can make that 1200 mil billet up to 18.2 meters long. Um, so what that means is you, you have access to, um, to sections that are as big as 1200 by 18.2 by 90 mil thick. Um, effectively straight, straight from our factory via a, a fabricator before arriving on site. Um, for members that are thicker than 90 millimeters, um, you can uh, specify thicker LVL sections. There is a secondary lamination process involved in that. Um, so you need a suitable fabricator to, to put two or more pieces of LVL together, uh, whether it's through glue or, or mechanical fasteners. Um, the other thing that's that's worth mentioning is our high joist I beam product, um, and I beams are, are particularly important for for some of the uh, the larger base basings and and these types of buildings. They're they're an efficient way of, of achieving larger spans. Um, so we have ten different standard sizes available in high joist, uh, ranging from two hundred up to four hundred deep, and um, we have made to order products available as well. Um, one of the design examples I'll show you has um, has four hundred and fifty mil deep I beams. Um, so for larger runs, we, we can make the water um, to, to suit whatever's most efficient for the project. And I guess LVL is well suited to, um, to manufacturing and to, to larger built up sections. Um, so you've got a solid piece of LVL in, in the middle there, um, but it's equally applicable to a, to a box beam, um, webs and flanges, as well as uh, what we call a, a fabricated deep, deep eye beam. And again, the design examples I have um, will cover all three types and, um, and where they're best used. Um, LVLs, of course, used in all sorts of other places and, and buildings, um, wall framing, um, pretty much any member you can think of in a, in a residential uh, house can be, can be made out of LVL, provided it's uh, 
it's weather protected. Um, and also in the commercial market, uh, timber concrete composite floors, and multi-story structural systems and, and so on. I also wanted to touch on cross-banded LVL. So cross-banded LVL, um, most of the products we make are what we call long-band long LVL, which is where all of the veneers run along the length of the beam. Um, cross-banded LVL is a special product where we, we put either two or four cross bands perpendicular to the face grain, uh, a little bit like what you'd expect with, with plywood, where every second veneer is typically a cross band. And there's, there's two reasons to do that. So one's for dimensional stability. So if you have a, a member that's very deep and not very broad, um, typically beyond depth to breadth ratio of 10, um, we typically recommend including cross bands um, for dimensional stability to prevent practical issues like cupping from occurring. And the other reason is, uh, is splitting resistance. Um, so introducing cross bands uh, prevents the long bands from, from splitting and, and something like a moment resisting connection. Um, so for something like a gusset or a box beam web, um, cross banded LVL is, is ideal. Um, we do carry limited stock of, um, of product in, in some thicknesses, um, but typically this is a made to order product as part of a wider, wider building system. So portal frames in general, um, what are they? I'm sure you know, everyone knows what a portal frame is, but it's a rigidly jointed frame that resists loads through flexure. Um, the advantage has been that your lateral loads are, are transferred directly to supports. Um, that simplifies the, the roof bracing and, and whatnot. Um, extensions are, are pretty readily accommodated if you pull it, sorry, put a full, um, full size portal frame into the end wall of the building. So the one on the bottom right here has a full size portal frame uh, for the simple reason that you know it, it opens it up to expansion by pushing the end wall out and adding more frames later on. Um, the other thing uh, that's worth mentioning there, I guess, is that there is sort of a market preference in these types of structures for low pitch with a you know, reduced waste and space overhead. Um, so if you look at other long span um, building systems, um, you know, long span trusses, for example, there tends to be a lot more depth involved and um, a bit more clutter around dust and cobwebs and, and things like that. So portal frames are, are an ideal solution for, for a lot of these larger span open, open plan buildings. I thought I'd run through a few of the common shapes. Um, so gable, that's the first one that comes to mind for me with a, with a portal frame building. Um, with, with LVL, uh, portal frames, we, we generally find a two pin frame uh, is, uh, is the most efficient. Um, so pins at the base, rigid connections at the eave and ridge. The ridge is a little bit flexible. So um, for low pitches, it makes sense to fix it. Once you get to a, a certain you know, roof pitch, you, you find the fixity at the ridge isn't actually doing a hell of a lot. Um, so what, what you tend to do there is, is introduce a pin instead and have a three pin frame. Um, keeping the roof pitch and the e-pipe down obviously makes sense from, a, from an efficiency perspective and, and reducing lateral loading and, and things like that. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning with gables, um, typically in an industrial building or a, or a large um, warehousing structure or, or something like that, there is the opportunity to introduce props typically. Um, now, often the most efficient way here is to have a, a pin prop um, like what we've shown in the, in the diagrams here. Um, the photo at the bottom, for example, is a, a 99 meter wide building um, that has three 33 meter bays, if you like. Um, a full portal frame around the outside to, to resist the, the sideways sway uh, still makes sense, but there, there isn't typically a lot of value in making the props uh, or making the prop connections moment resisting. The other common shapes, uh, skillion or mono pitch, um, your span there can be limited by the LVL length we have available at 18.2 meters, unless you introduce a, a splice. Um, there is a tendency for it to sway due to the asymmetry, even just under vertical loading. Um, mansard roofs aren't as common as they used to be, um, but you know the advantage with that shape is that uh, you get reduced knee moments, um, which can make them quite efficient for achieving larger spans. And lastly, I, th I thought I'd put up an example of a curved, curved roof shape. Um, LVL can't be produced in a, in a physical curve, 
Um, as I said before, we, we produce a straight 1200 mil wide billet. If you want the, the member to be curved, you actually have to cut a curve out of the billet, which introduced wastage, which is um, undesirable, of course, um, and in and, and most projects anyway. Um, this particular building is actually straight segments on the bottom edge with, uh, with the splices that you, you can see in here, but the top is cut in a radius. So this was a, a hollow box section, which varied you know, when cutting the radius from, uh, from the full 1200 mil billet depth down to about 870 at the, at the splice connections. And the, uh, the top flange over this particular radius um, could be bent to shape. Um, so that was quite a good uh, solution for this particular uh, tennis club building. Um, so cur curves are possible as well, uh, particularly if some straight elements are still acceptable. And I guess lastly, high narrow buildings, this, this is another variation on the gable, I guess. Um, you tend to find with, with very high buildings, if you pin the base, you get a lot of sway and very high knee moments. If you fix the base, that reduces that substantially. Um, but often the base moment to see it can be, can be difficult to accommodate depending on the ground conditions and, and that sort of thing. Um, so one thing that's worth looking at is, is introducing some articulation at a, at a fixed height above the ground level. And that allows you to vary, you know, varying the height of, of the H there in the diagram will, will vary how much moment and sway you have up, up in the frame versus um, what the, the loads are down at the, uh, down at the base. So uh, thinking about LVL portal frames, they're not really a new thing for, for Australasia. Um, the first LVL building I'm aware of in, in this sort of arrangement was about 1987 in Mount Gambia. Um, that one had a gantry crane in it as well. Um, it's been ex used ex extensively across Australasia since then and in all sorts of building applications, but um, notably uh, anywhere a, a level of corrosion resistance is required, um, it's kind of low hanging fruit, a, a timber structure, whether it's a swimming pool or, or fertilizer, or on, on the case of the bottom, bottom right hand side there, it's a uh, composting building. There, there's a lot more options now than, than there were in years gone by as, as far as connections with, uh, with portal frames. You still have the same conventional uh, rigid moment resisting technology that was available you know, decades ago in the form of uh, gussets, um, whether it's a nailed plywood or LVL gusset or a, or a steel gusset. You've got examples of both on the screen here. Um, if you are gonna do a steel gusset, we would normally recommend not using nails. Um, the reason for that is that you can't use a nail gun typically um, when you're driving nails through a steel gusset. Um, so by using screws, you reduce the number of fasteners because of the larger diameter, um, but also you can drive a self-drilling screw a lot faster than you can hand drive a nail. Um, there's a few other technologies here on the screen. Um, in, the, in the bottom right hand side, we've got two variations on a, on a steel plate that's, uh, that fit, fixed into uh, the flange of an LVL built up section and then uh, bolted to a steel element. Up in the top right, you have uh, an example of the Quick Connect that was developed through the, uh, the Stick Research Consortium and uh, Auckland University. And on the left-hand side, it's a little bit hard to see in this photo. You can see the bolts, oops, go back one. You can see the bolts pretty well, but the bolts are actually only applying clamping pressure there. Um, the moment resistance is actually primarily formed uh, by a steel plate that's in between those two LVL members and tight fitting dowels that go through the, uh, through the timber and, um, and through, the, uh, through the steel plate. So there's various types if we focus a little bit on, on gussets and, um, and similar connection technologies. This still tends to be one of the more cost-effective ways of, of doing things. Um, and it's been around for, for a long time, of course. Um, plywood gussets on the left, that's probably what most people think of when they think of a, a portal frame and timber and, and a moment connection. Um, Plywood practically is, is limited to about 25 mil thick and, and F8 grade in, in New Zealand. Um, you, you find for, for larger span portal frames that that's nowhere near the capacity that's required for that type of connection. Um, so you would jump up to a, a cross banded LBL section, which typically we start off at, at about 42 millimeters in thickness. Um, that has much higher capacity being thicker 
and also because only four of the bands are uh, or four of the veneers are cross bands you have more contribution um, from the longitudinal veneers as well um, the middle we have um, this can be quite a tidy connection if you're using a, a box section for the column um, actually just projecting the webs upwards and um, and using them as a gusset effectively um, and on the right hand side this is a, a very high capacity connection with uh, an external gusset that doesn't necessarily follow the shape of the uh, of the frame behind it. Um, one of the main advantages here is, is the sheer amount of area you get an overlap for, for nailing or, or screwing to the frame in behind, um, but also you're, you're mobilizing the full, typically this would be a, a 1200 mil wide um, LBL section, so you're utilizing the full, full depth of that. So why use an LVL portal frame? Um, this is pretty subjective, of course, but aesthetics. Um, a lot of people will agree that uh, that there's a general warmth about uh, a timber building. And um, of course, architectural flexibility is, is important too, but we have a lot more options there with different connectors available, both concealed and exposed. Um, environmentally friendly, so it's a green solution being made from, from renewable plantation pine. Woods carbon storing rather than adding carbon to the environment in, in general. Um, we do have FSC certified material available on request. And if it's a living building challenge um, structure, um, we've also got the clear label red list free uh, for LVL, uh, future build LVL, uh, H1.2 and untreated uh, specifically. Corrosion resistance, I mentioned this earlier. Timber-based solutions like LVL are, are pretty inert to most acids and alkalines within a pH range of about two and 10. So the, the picture in the background there is a, a fertilizer building um, we were involved with. Um, if you combine that with, uh, with corrosion resistant connections, um, typically stainless steel fasteners and, and plates and that sort of thing, um, you can get into paint systems as well, of course, and, and maintenance, but generally it's, it's ideally suited to, to a corrosive environment. Um, we do recommend confirming the specific chemical composition of whatever is going to be stored in, in the building, of course, as part of the design process. Um, but typically there's, there's large advantages in reduction of ongoing maintenance in, uh, in this sort of environment. Lastly, I, I think the high strength to weight ratio of, of LVL is important to mention as well. So LVL has a higher strength to weight ratio than hot rolled steel. Um, typically, that enables large areas of, of roof framing to be assembled at ground level. And a good example of this, this is the um, one of the design examples that I'll, that I'll put up um, later on. But in the background there, you can see at ground level, there's a large area of roof that's been constructed um, on, the, uh, on the concrete slab there. That means things like the secondary framing can be done at ground level. Um, you can do bracing, um, wire netting or mesh if, if that's required for the roof. Um, essentially everything that makes sense to do down at ground level where it's safe and, and comparatively quick um, compared to do it at height, um, you, you, would, you would do it ground level and then, uh, and then pick it up and, and put it on top of the columns as shown here. So as far as design guidance with the portal frames themselves, um, the design criteria here tends to be based on the structure you're designing, not, not the material type. So there's typically not much that's different um, compared to say a structural steel design. Um, you're still doing your loading in accordance with the relevant loading standard, typically AS, NZS, um, 1170 of course. Um, it's worth mentioning the footings can have significant savings compared to say a concrete building because of the lower, lower mass involved in the structure. Um, optimal member spans and, and bay and frame spacings and whatnot may be different for timber versus steel and concrete. Um, for example, if, if you're looking at an, an industrial building and a steel portal frame, you might be working with say an eight meter bay spacing um, as being the most efficient. Um, when you're looking at a, at a timber alternative or equivalent, it may actually be more efficient to open that up to, to say 10 meters. Um, so you've got to bear that in mind. Of course, there's flexibility involved and in, in, in everything, but um, if you're comparing one material to another, it, it certainly helps to be looking at efficiencies. 
So the actual analysis you do, um, whether it's microstrand or space gas or ETABs or, or whatever package is being used, the elastic analysis is, is much the same. Um, the thing that varies is, is the structural properties. Um, you don't need to consider shear deflection with a solid LVL um, product. And um, some people might thinking might be thinking they've never thought about shear deflection with um, with a timber product before. So that, that's something you, you need to consider if it's a built up section like an I-beam or a box. And I'll, I'll go through that in a bit more detail later on in, in the design example. Um, the limits you put in here for serviceability tend to be similar to, to see on concrete, of course. It's more about the building and the performance and less about the material. But you do need to think about creep. Um, so creep is a phenomenon that you can't get away from with, uh, with timber. Um, it's, it's very easy to cater for in, in the packages. Um, you can do it by hand. Um, if you've got, say, a creep factor of two, just by doubling the, the deflection that pops out. Um, but you can also get a little bit cleverer about that by, um, by doubling the, the loads that are, that are input for the, for the serviceability gravity case and, um, and things like that. With respect to the actual selection of the, the frame itself, typically what you want to start with is a, a solid LVL single section. Um, and you tend to find that um, relatively slender sections, because LVL is, is largely driven by uh, the volume of product involved, um, something that's relatively deep and skinny tends to be the most cost effective way. Um, once you, you get to you know, as far as you can get with a with a single solid section, that's when you start considering built up members. And there's advantages and disadvantages to, to all three of the members you see at the bottom there, being an I-beam, a box beam, and, and a solid section. Um, the thing they have in common is that they all require assembly by a fabricator before going to site. Um, but there's, there's pretty drastic differences in terms of the amount of material involved and, and the structural um, the structural performance. Um, and again, we'll, we'll go through the positives and negatives in, in a couple of design examples. Um, it's worth noting, you, you can get to spans up to about 30 meters for a typical industrial building, depending where it is in the country and the loading, um, with, with a 900 by 90 LVL section, which is where you top out as a, as a single section with a depth to breadth of, of 10. So what, what we'd recommend doing is, is starting by sizing the frame members for serviceability. So because LVL has good strength compared with its stiffness, um, you know, where you might be used to say sawn timber, um, starting with, with strength in a lot of cases, um, and, and even structural steel to an extent, um, LVL is, is quite good with strength compared to stiffness. So generally speaking, if you can get your structure to work for serviceability first, you'll find there isn't a lot of tweaking to be done in most cases when you get to the strength design stage of the, of the process. Um, but for solid sections, again, slender sections tend to be where, where you end up with the depth, the breadth of, of near 10. You do need to consider um, lateral buckling effects, of course, with a slender section quite carefully. Um, the purlins, we would typically recommend butting into the side of the portal frame rather than sitting on top. Um, and there's two reasons for that. T typically an LVL member that's, that's efficient is gonna be deeper than, than a steel equivalent. So by bringing the secondary structure into the side of it, reduces the overall roof depth um, from a structure perspective. Um, and often it brings it down to something that's quite similar to a hot rolled steel section with purlins sitting on top. The other reason for bringing it into the side is um, provides very good lateral restraint to the top of the, the rafter and it makes connection quite straightforward. So in the case of a, a solid LVL purlin, like what you see in the photo there, um, a proprietary joist hanger works very well in, in nearly all cases with, um, with continuity strap along the top to transfer uh, tension loads down the length of the building. Um, in the case of an I-beam, much the same thing with the continuity strap, but often instead of using a proprietary bracket, you would use a, an LVL connection block. And look, I guess I, I mentioned um, lateral stability. Fly braces would be no surprise are a good way to provide restraint to the, the bottom edge of the, uh, or the unrestrained edge of a, of a relatively slender section. 
and those can be tied back up to the purlins in, in much the same way as a, as a steel structure. I don't want to spend too much time on, on getting into um, getting into serviceability requirements and things like that, purely because again, it's very similar to um, to other material types. It's more about the building and less about the, the material. Um, sway is something that needs to be considered. Um, and that's both under gravity loads and under lateral loads, particularly if you have an asymmetric shape, you will get sway due to, um, due to the gravity loading. Um, and you want to make sure you don't have a noticeable out of plumb appearance, of course. Um, lateral loads, both seismic and wind, of course, need to be considered. Um, a lot of the time, an elastic or, or nominally ductile um, analysis is, is most appropriate for, a, for an LVL portal frame. You can, with things like nailed gussets, get into looking at higher levels of ductility, um, but practically, um, you know, not nominally ductile frames. Um, tend to be uh, pretty close in a lot of cases to, to what your wind is. And, and unless you're in a very sheltered environment for wind and a relatively high seismic um, seismic area. Um, of course, you, you want to think about how much sway is acceptable for, for the particular project you, you have in mind and, um, and restrict it accordingly. If you have a high sway, it's normally a good indication that your bending moments are going to be quite high anyway. So again, if you get the serviceability right, it tends to get the frame sizes to where they need to be anyway. Um, you do need to think about ridge deflection. Um, typically in these buildings, you end up with, uh, with an end wall that has uh, mullions in it and therefore is quite rigid. And you've got to think about um, what, the, uh, what the ridge looks like relative to that and, and how noticeable the deflection of that, that next frame in will be. Um, of course, you've also got to think about the deflection of the rafter itself. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning here, um, people often talk about pre-camber. Um, pre-camber of, of the LVL section itself, I mentioned before with the curved cre creation of a curved member, it's not possible unless you cut a curve out of the billet. Um, what you can do though, is, um, is look at pre-camber at, uh, at the actual joints in the, in the structure. So if you've got a continuous member, there isn't pre-camber available essentially, but for something like a, a simple gable shaped with a um, with a ridge with a with a gusset, you can actually build the frame slightly pre-cambered during construction, which doesn't cost anything extra, um, but can make quite a big difference in the in the final settled shape of the of the building. The other thing worth mentioning is that um, you don't necessarily have to have a prop um, if you've got props through the through the building. Um, but you happen to have a couple of bays or a bay uh, where you, you can't accommodate props. Um, you can introduce portal frames in the other direction to provide support for the rafter instead. Um, this is um, our Marsden Point facility during construction. So we, we had a couple of bays where we, we didn't want to have the props because of uh, equipment requirements and, and movement through there. Um, you do have to be mindful that any deflection you get in that secondary um, that secondary portal frame running perpendicular will directly um, impact on the ridge line. So it needs to be quite stiff, of course. Um, but you can also use them for longitudinal bracing, um, being, a, being a full frame like that. So with respect to purlin and girt selection, um, this, this differs from, from the frame in that you have a few more options available from a material selection perspective. Um, a high joist tends to be the go-to for, for large base spacings. So once you get beyond a base spacing of about seven to eight meters, so that's the span between the portal frames, um, that's where a, a composite I-beam uh, comes into its own. Below that seven to eight meter range, um, high span or, or another solid LVL section, high cord, high 90, whatever it is, that tends to make more sense. Um, and what I might do is just jump ahead a slide the, the reason for that is that there is a bit more lateral restraint, restraint required with, um, with a high joist I-beam. So you can see in this, um, in this photo here, there's two rows of lateral restraint, providing restraint to the bottom edge of the purlin. Um, and the reason that that's there is that it, it needs restraint in a wind uplift case where that bottom edge becomes the, uh, the compression flange and wants to buckle sideways. So a, a blocking piece, um, Intermittent blocking pieces like what's shown here with, with some LBL to link them up tends to be the most cost-effective way of doing that. 
Um, it's a little bit like a, a fast break system, I guess, um, if you're looking at DHS Perlins. Um, your, your requirements there don't tend to be as onerous for a solid section. Um, so that there are a number of advantages in the I-beam and, and that it's lightweight, um, there's a lot less material and therefore it tends to be more cost effective from a material perspective um, and the nature of the I-beam and, and lateral stability. Um, but because there's a little bit more involved in an installation, um, it's best kept for the larger spans and the simplicity of a solid section kept for the, the smaller spans. And of course, if you have a very small base spacing, you know, below 4.8 metres or thereabouts, um, a typical, you know, timber, sawn timber, SG8 or SG6, SG10 type uh, product makes a lot of sense. So girts are a little bit different. Um, there's two options there. They can span from portal to portal, uh, much the same as the purlins do. Or what's often the case is um, that you introduce intermediate mullions for support to reduce the girt span and, and make the girt smaller. Um, cost effective wise, you know, for, for larger base spacings, mullions absolutely make sense, um, provided you can accommodate uh, the mullion. Does mean you, you also introduce a, a beam at the eave um, where the mullion spans from the ground up to a, a beam at the eave, um, but it does dramatically reduce the, the girt sizes. Uh, generally, the girts will be placed on flat, of course. Again, we would recommend butting those into the columns in, in a similar fashion to the, the purlins, which is a little bit different to what you'd normally do with, with structural steel. Um, and the wall framing is also a good opportunity to use up billet off cuts that not, might not be used elsewhere. Um, for example, if you were using, say, a 900 by 90 uh, portal frame member, there's a 300 by 90 off cut associated with that. And uh, there's a good opportunity to use that up for things like girts, mullions, eave beams. Um, you, you don't want to be um, building um, billet off cuts into the cost of a project. You want to use them up wherever possible. Bracing is also important to mention. Um, these buildings all need bracing in the longitudinal direction as well as the lateral direction. Um, typically that's in the form of cross bracing. Um, for small buildings, steel strap can be uh, quite economical. It's a little bit more difficult to achieve square with the building during construction with steel strap, but you know it's, it's a very economical way of, of doing it. Plywood shear walls, of course, are, are also possible. If, uh, if cross bracing is undesirable for whatever reason. Um, that does tend to change the, the wall framing. Um, you tend to end up with more of a stud running vertically up to a, up to a beam in that case. Um, like you can see in that, that photo on the bottom left there, which is quite an old project now, but um, demonstrates the, uh, the use of plywood bracing. For larger buildings, strap can still look technically feasible um, in a lot of cases. But um, once you factor an installation of this you know, type of uh, type building structure, um, prefabricated timber braces or, or steel rod bracing looks, uh, looks a lot more attractive. Um, and that, that's what we'll typically recommend for this type of uh, larger structure. Um, so you've, you've got various different um, steel rod systems around, of course, typically proprietary. Um, you can also design LVL braces. And that, the advantage with an LVL brace being a bit chunkier is that it can actually be used in uh, compression and tension. So in this particular photo, this is the same one I, I had up earlier. Um, in the roof, those braces are actually being used in, in tension and compression. That's why you don't have the normal cross that you would have. Um, in the wall, it was simpler to, to run with, um, with tension only. So that's why you've got, you've got the two. Um, you can also introduce a cross um, with, a, with a cross, you've, you've just got to think a little bit about the interaction in the middle. So it becomes another steel plate inserted in the, uh, inserted in the LBL. Um, but this is certainly something that's been used widely uh, over the years. So first building example, Marston Point. Um, this is actually where we make our, our LBL now in New Zealand. Um, it's quite a large structure, so it's 96 metres wide in the press part of the building, um, 209 metres long. Um, obviously, it's not a 96 metre span. That would be pretty pretty impressive. But um, it has two props. So there's three spans involved, 32 metres each, with a 11 metre 
uh, spacing between the frames. The veneer building is very similar. It's 58 meters wide, uh, only two spans and that one being, being smaller in width. Um, there are a lot of practical issues to work through on this one around clear heights, um, production issues from a sawdust accumulation perspective. Um, we dry veneer in this building in, in our dryers, so moisture management was also important. The machinery layout heavily dictated um, where props were, uh, whether you could get away with, um, with having props or not in a particular area. Um, and it was all manufactured and prefabricated in Australia because obviously at the time we didn't have an LBL mill in New Zealand. Um, roof sheet length is also something that you, you need to think about in, in these larger, very wide buildings. Um, so these were the, the two sections. Um, what was actually used here was, was an I-beam. Um, that was the most efficient for this particular building. And um, you can see here that the ridge lines of the buildings don't actually line up. And the reason for that was equip, equipment requirements and, and heights. We had a particularly large height required in the left-hand bay um, of the northern end, um, a bit more regular at the, at the southern end. And we didn't want to have the, the building that much higher for the, for the whole length. Um, so what was actually introduced was a roof step there, as you can see in the, in the photo. So the asymmetric frames form about, I think, yeah, 11 of the 19 frames. Um, so about two thirds of the, of the building was, um, was that asymmetric shape. There were two sets of bracing applied. You can see um, that perpendicular frame I talked about in the photo as, as well. Um, the purlins in this case were 450 mil deep. So they were specifically manufactured for this project. And there were actually two different flange sizes applied as well. Um, so we used the larger flanges and closer spacings in the higher demand areas. Quite a bit of product involved in this, uh, over 600 cubic meters of LBL, uh, 50 cubic meters of plywood and uh, a smaller amount of, of sawn timber. So this is what the frame members looked like. So they consisted of, of 1200 mil deep cross-banded LVL sections that were 63 mil wide, acting as a web, and some uh, LVL flanges, just normal LVL, not cross-banded, um, that were 400 by 45 on both sides. Um, the columns were tapered down to 800 mil at the base. So they were the full 1200 mil width up at the knee where it needed the full capacity and tapered back at, at the base. Um, the rafter, we actually projected the, uh, the flanges up a little bit um, to provide a bit more structural depth. And there was a, a filler at the top there. So this is a, a sort of a diagram and, and photo of a splice happening on site. Um, this particular one uh, was, was done at height. Um, essentially what's happening there is the the flanges of one section were extended and the web of the other section was extended and uh, it was it was lapped. Um, so you need enough fasteners, enough length there, obviously to transfer the loads and tension and compression. And uh, that, that was a nailed connection on site. Um, the shear block was also introduced to transfer the shear. So the flanges were transferring the tension and compression and the, the shear through the separate block. This is the, the two bay part of the building that, that I talked about, a little bit smaller. So I wanna mention our, our software solutions. Um, many of you have probably heard of Design It For Houses. Um, that's been around for a long time for the, uh, the residential market. We have got some software packages specifically for engineers um, called Compute It. Um, so Compute It For Beams is, is the first one of those packages. That's a beam analysis package um, and it's purely for engineers. So you're, you're inputting your loads and load cases and load combinations, and it's presenting you with the results in the form of bending moment diagrams, capacities and, um, and shear force. Um, it will also show you a deflection curve. It's particularly useful for things like I-beams where um, the calculation of shear deflection is, is relatively tricky to do by hand or even to an extent in a spreadsheet if it's a, um, if it's a statically indeterminate I-beam. Um, so this, this takes some of the specific timber phenomena out of it and um, allows you to, to put your loads in and, and see the results. 
Um, we've got a new version coming out for this tomorrow. Um, so it's a, it's a free package you can download from our website at, at chhsoftware.co.nz. The new version doesn't require administration rights and will keep itself up to date, which is, um, which is a, a big advantage. The other thing is it will allow you to design to the new draft NZS A1720.1 um, just by selecting category two for the application category. The one that's uh, been used heavily and, and I'll go through in the next design example is Compute It Toolkit. So that's a separate package. And this is a collection of tools. That's what we call it a toolkit um, for portal frame building design, essentially. So it's, it's designed to allow quick and easy design of beam and column members, as well as moment resistant connections. And we have a Perlin and GERT calculated in there as well. Um, again, there's a new version for that uh, coming out tomorrow. And um, that will do the design to the draft NZSA 1720.1 as well. So the, the second building I wanted to run through quickly is the uh, the Fungaray dry mill. Um, this one's a little bit different to, um, to Marsden Point. It's a mixture of solid sections and box sections. Um, it's also manufactured from uh, New Zealand made LVL, given we had the, uh, the Marsden Point facility running at that point, obviously. Um, we used I-beams again for the rafters. The bay here was a bit smaller at 10 meters, but um, still much larger than it made sense to use solid purlins for. Um, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about bay lifting and, and things like that as we go. Um, but essentially the brief here was to develop a, a cost-effective, structurally efficient design for what's essentially a 12,000 square meter building. Um, so the member selection was based on what was actually available obviously what, what did the job structurally and also the level of fabrication expertise required. Um, the versatility of LVL here allowed us to develop a frame that, that had a mixture of, of different products and, and different areas as it made sense. So th this is the building footprint. It's a bit of a, an L shape. Um, it's 99 meters wide at, at the wide end and there's, uh, there's three uh, 33 meter spans essentially. Um, one portal frame covering the full width, but, uh, but two props looking a bit like this. Um, because we didn't need the, the full width for the full length of the building, um, in this case, it was, it was best to keep the ridge line the same um, and just shift the, uh, the outer frame column in. So the two frames look a little bit different structurally, but, um, but fundamentally the same idea. That's a picture of the, the building during construction. Um, obviously, once it was clad, you wouldn't really know it was a, a timber building. Um, but a, a good demonstration of, of those props. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning with the props, um, we've found it beneficial to build those up on a, on a concrete plinth. Um, if you've got four coists and things like that running around in there, and this, to be honest, probably applies irrespective of the material that's used. But um, having something um, like concrete at the, at the base there is, is a good idea. So there's a few pictures here of the construction process. Again, a, a bay lift technique was, uh, was what was employed here. Um, whether you do one bay at a time or two bays at a time, what's shown here depends a little bit on, on craneage, what access is like on the site and that sort of thing. Obviously the, the bigger area you can construct on the ground, the more efficient it tends to be from a process perspective. Um, but certainly, uh, certainly two bays worked very well for this particular building. If you had smaller cranes or, or less access, it, it might be more of a one bay at a time thing. So the Perlin design, um, we used I-beams here again. When you're looking at I-beams in, in a large building roof like this, you'll find that the wind pressures because of local pressure factors at the eaves and at the end bays of the building are a lot higher than what you have in the middle part of the building. And there's a couple of ways to deal with that. You can look at using the same purlin, but reducing the spacing. Um, the disadvantage there is there's more components and more connections to do on site. Um, the other option you have is, is to use a bigger I-beam in those high demand areas. Um, and we do have the ability to, to make um, specific I-beams, as I mentioned, for these larger structures. Um, and lastly, you can increase the number of lateral restraints um, to the bottom edge, if the bottom edge is critical for, or bottom flange rather, uh, for, the, for the design. 
So in this particular case, we, we actually did both. And this is the Perlin layout. It's probably a little bit difficult to read on the screen there, but the middle part of the building used a, a common off the shelf I-beam. Um, the outer part of the building used a larger flange, um, which is this one here with a, with a thicker flange than, than normal. Um, and at the very edge where the, the local pressure factor was the highest, um, the spacing was closed up as well. The other thing that's worth noting here is that because the run from here is about 44 metres, um, the, the roof sheeting length and expansion and contraction came into it as well. So you'll notice here there's, there's a double purlin and a bit of a step in the roof. And that was achieved at the splice connection at that particular location. Um, and that's to facilitate a roof step purely from a, a roof sheeting perspective. Don't think we have time to get too much into the detail of, of I-beam purlin design. Um, but the important thing to note here is it's not the same as designing a solid section. You do need to consider shear deflection and the shear deflection can be quite significant. You know, it can be sort of 20, 25% of the overall deflection of the member. So for single span purlins, um, this equation here is quite easy. For continuous spans and things like that, it, it gets a lot trickier and that's where an analysis package like Compute It for Beams becomes quite helpful. Um, in this case here, again, I won't spend too much time on it, but there were a couple of different cases um, to, to look at. And um, typically when you're looking at this, there's a lot of playing around with, um, with spacings and flange sizes until you get to a point where it, where it looks the most efficient. So what we recommend doing is calculating loads on a kilonewton per meter per, per meter basis or KPA effectively. So as an area rather than um, as, a, as a load on a, on a particular spacing. Um, otherwise you have to come back and keep recalculating it. Um, and this is one of the screens from our computer toolkit software. So we, we actually ask for entry in kilonewtons per meter per meter or, or KPA. Um, and that allows you to change the, the Perlin spacing here as much as you like and for the numbers to recalculate accordingly. Um, so the, the software will help you with both the deflection, including shear deflection for I-beams um, for whatever cases uh, have actually been entered. And also the, the bending capacity. Um, and it allows you to vary the number of lateral restraints you add in the case of an I-beam um, and, and assess the, the result on the, uh, the moment capacity there. Um, there's certainly a point where adding more restraints doesn't give you more capacity because there's a point where the tension capacity of the flange um, governs the design rather than the, the buckling of the, uh, the compression flange and, uh, and compression. So the portal frame itself, um, this is kind of a, a loose envelope of the, uh, the vertical loading that's involved. Um, you can see, of course, at the, at the knees and over the props, you have quite high bending moments. Um, and then in between, um, you, ha you have reasonably large bending moments as well, but not to the same extent. Um, the other thing is that the direction there is, is different. So um, you, you have compression edge restraint in, in the center here. Obviously, this is, this is downward loads, not, not wind uplift. Um, but you have compression restraint to the rafter R2 here um, with, the, with the bending moment here. You don't have the same thing over the, uh, over the column. It's worth mentioning, um, we, we've actually used different sections here. So you can see there's a number of splices and um, R2 in this case is a solid section, R3 and R4 are box sections. Um, the box sections have, have higher stiffness and higher bending capacity as well. And you, you can play around with different stiffnesses in a building like this, and it's well worth looking at um, to attract the moment to, to where, where you want it to. So reducing the rigidity draws less moment to a section as a, as a general rule, um, provided you can deal with that from a serviceability perspective, it can be an advantage at, at the strength stage. Um, there was also quite a bit of ease involved with a, with a splice with a box section. So when you're connecting a, a solid bit of LVL to a box on site, the moment connection becomes really easy. Uh, we kept the solid section to a depth to breadth ratio of 10, um, and we used fly braces um, through the building where it made sense as well. 
So for the solid rafter, again, I, I'm conscious we're, we're short of time here, but um, this, this is our software. Essentially, you're feeding in these bending moment design action effects um, straight out of your analysis package and into the software. And then the variable here is, is the size of the member that you're working with and your unrestrained length, typically. Um, so you can play around with those and get the resulting impact on, on the strength of the member very quickly. Um, it will also do compression and tension and, and shear checks um, by feeding in the design actions and the relevant lengths for, uh, for buckling from a compression perspective. And it will do the combined actions as well. Um, so it makes it quite quick and easy to, to run through that. If you find you've got a lot up your sleeve or you need a little bit more capacity, it's very quick to hit the change button down the bottom and change the grade or change the size, whatever is, uh, is the appropriate, um, appropriate action there. Similarly with the box sections, we've used the box sections where a higher moment capacity is required over the props and, um, and at the eaves. Um, it would have been possible to do this with a broader solid section, of course, but um, the advantage with the box is it provides you quite a lot of lateral stability. Um, so you tend to find there's less fly braces um, involved. The splices become quite easy um, because you're protruding the, the webs to create the splice. And the hollow section helps to optimize the amount of material that goes into it. Um, so a, a box beam isn't a new form of construction. There's lots of buildings around that have been constructed using plywood box beams. Um, LVL box beams have some advantages over plywood in that the LVL can be made, I was going to say as long as you like, but up to 18.2 metres long. Um, plywood is typically only available 2.4 or 2.7 metres long. So every time you have a plywood sheet join, you need to have a, um, a shear connection built into the box. Don't have that problem with LVL typically. Um, LVL is also produced at a, a number of different thicknesses, of course, and, um, and therefore can have higher bending capacity for, for the splicing. Um, you also tend to find because the webs are thicker, they provide quite a lot of contribution to the overall bending strength of the, uh, of the box. So assembly can be quite, quite straightforward or, or a bit more high tech, depending on uh, who's doing the prefabrication. Uh, a box section, the flange to web joint can be done using glue. Um, obviously that needs to be a very controlled gluing process. It can also be done through mechanical fasteners. Um, and with mechanical fasteners, we would still recommend using glue. Um, and that, that's for two reasons. One, the glue can remove the nail slip involved with, uh, with relying just on the mechanical fasteners. And, and the other reason is, uh, is moisture management. So typically a building is going to be exposed to some, some moisture during construction and um, the glue provides a, a waterproofing uh, method, if you like, for preventing water from getting in between the flange and the, and the web. Once moisture gets into the middle of a box section, you can imagine it's quite difficult to dry it out. Um, webs, we would recommend using cross-banded LBL for a, for a box beam for two reasons, that the nailing that's required if, if you're doing nailing, but also the webs tend to be quite slender. So as I've mentioned, beyond that depth, the breadth of 10, um, cross bands provide you with, uh, with that stiffness in the, in the, across the, the billet um, direction, if you like. So comparing a solid with a box. Um, so on the left here, we've got a 1200 by 180 bit of LVL. On the right, we've got a box section with essentially the same stiffness. Um, there's quite a big volume difference in terms of the amount of LVL that goes into the box versus the solid. So there's a lot more in the solid, obviously, than there is in the box. They would both require a secondary process as far as assembling them. So in the case of the 1200 by 180, it's two bits of 1200 by 90 LVL that are, that are glued or connected together um, by mechanical means. With the box, it's four pieces um, rather than two pieces. So there's a little bit more to it. But in both cases, you've got a secondary process involved there, I guess. Um, the moment capacity is, is quite different. And, and that's because there's, there's about the weak axis, um, there's, a lot more, uh, there's a lot more stiffness in, in the, uh, the box section than there is in the, uh, the solid section. Um, you can see if, if you fully restrain them, they're very similar. 
but it's very unusual to have full restraint um, in a, um, a portal frame situation. So if you have a unrestrained length of say seven and a half meters, there's a, there's a reasonable gap here in, in capacity. And, and that's one of the reasons that we went for a box section in those high moment areas for the, uh, for the dry mill. We're running out of time here. So um, look, uh, box beam design is subject to shear deflection, very similar to I-beams. Um, it's not generally catered for in analysis programs automatically. So you typically need to do some manual input. Um, so you can use Hooke's law to, to adjust the, the ratio here. And I, I know because I've used MicroStrand and SpaceGas that you can, uh, you can enter that manually for those two programs. Um, I would imagine it's the same for all, all the others as well. Um, you do need to enter a shear area, which is the area of the webs in the case of a box beam as well. Um, and then it will, it will calculate the shear deflection for you and include that in the, in the uh, deflection that's, that's output. So it's important not to forget about that because it can be a significant, a significant amount of extra, um, extra deflection. With the box beam, um, you have an overall section capacity, which is um, based on the overall properties of the finished box. Um, but you also need to check the, the capacity of the flanges and tension and compression and the capacity of the web and bending as separate items. Um, and again, uh, the computer toolkit software will, will help you with that. Um, there's a couple of, a couple of screen grabs here, but it's a very similar process to the solid section. You feed in your uh, moment demands or axial demands. Um, you, uh, you feed in your unrestrained length LAY, and it will calculate the moment capacity, um, both of the overall section. And um, you can see at the bottom here, we, we give you the minimum, whether it's the overall capacity or the, uh, the combined flange and web capacity. And again, it gives you the combined actions at the far end. Billet utilization, this building is a, is a good example of that. Um, You've got a 1200 by 105 and a 1200 by 42 as far as what's manufactured and, um, and costed into the structure. Um, you're only using a 1050 by 105 and, and 1050 by 42 for the actual main frames. So finding a home for that last 150 mil of the billet is, um, is the best way to reduce the cost of the overall structure. In the case of the 150 by 42, that made a good girt. Um, and the offcut from the, uh, from the solid rafter was used as flange for the uh, for the boxes. Um, so typically with a box section, if, if you're interfacing with a solid LVL section, you want the flange of the box to be slightly wider to make sure you've got a little bit of tolerance on site and things will actually fit together. So in this case here, it was a 108 by, by 105 flange to interface with a 105 mil thick um, piece of LVL. Um, much the same case with the, with the splice connection. Um, the toolkit software will, will help with this. You feed in the design actions. Um, it will help you with both the design of the webs of the box beam and also the, uh, the plywood nailing pattern, or sorry, LVL nailing pattern in this case. Um, what's nice about the software is it actually dynamically draws the connection you've designed. So you can see if you've designed something that looks a bit ridiculous, um, this, this is very achievable on site, but if you were seeing more nails here than than wood, that's a good sign that um, the connection is not that practical and, and you need to go back to the drawing board. So that's that's quite a good um, feature, being able to actually see the connection without having to go and draw it manually. So I'll, I'll finish with a few practical tips. Um, I've talked about the cross-banded LBL thing. Use billet multiples or standard section sizes wherever possible. Um, Always include fastness specifics on drawings. Um, it's not unusual to see some missing information here in, in, in our experience. Um, diameter, length, spacing, they're all important. Um, and it's also important to make sure that the fastener that you've selected is actually commercially available. Um, nails in particular there, um, practically it's difficult to find nails that, that are longer than 100 mil that will fit in a, um, in a gun. Um, Typically during the design, if you can, you want to detail which components are going to be fixed in the factory um, and put that on the drawings. You know, this, this connection is going to be fi factory fixed. This one needs to be done on site. 
provides the fabricator and the builder with a lot more certainty about what who's doing what. Um, we'd recommend sealing or painting all, all primary um, frame members um, before they get to site. And that limits moisture uptake. So most of the major paint manufacturers these days have a clear temporary sealer type connection for this type of application. Um, and it, it just helps, particularly with the primary frame members where they need to fit together with some accuracy. Um, you don't want things swelling because of moisture exposure before you can get those connections made. Um, any lamination you do with built up sections, whether it's a double section, whether it's a box or an I-beam, should include a glue sealant and that prevents moisture from getting in because again, once it gets in, it's very difficult to dry it out. We would always recommend adding a moisture barrier at the base of a column or a mullion. And, and I don't just mean DPC between say a concrete slab and the bottom of the column. We typically would recommend including an appropriate structural packer underneath. And the reason for that is typically during construction, there's some ponding on the slab. And what you don't want is the end grain. Um, so the end grain of, of wood tends to draw moisture in a bit like a straw. You wanna keep that out of that ponding. So if you can include something like a, an appropriately treated structural plywood packer under the LVL column, um, typically it's only about 20 millimeters thick um, that you, you need to think about. That just helps to keep that, that LVL end grain out of the, the ponding. Would always recommend spray painting on nail patterns in the factory. Um, if you can keep your nail patterns similar across the building so that you can use the same template, that's great. Um, but it, it becomes a lot easier from a QA perspective if you can see that the nail pattern is there and that there's a nail on every dot that's been spray painted onto the, uh, onto the frame. If gussets are going on in the factory, there isn't really any reason not to glue nail them. Um, on site, glue is very messy if you're putting gussets on, but in a factory, that's, that's a lot more controlled. We'd recommend pre-drilling the holes during prefabrication, wherever you can get away with it. Um, if you need to build in some tolerance and therefore only drill one end of a purlin, say, for, for um, say, bolt holes, um, that's fine, but pre-drill the one end, so at least it's, it's half the amount of accurate work that's required on site. Steel brackets, when you're detailing those, it's important to take into account timber tolerance. So if you look at our LVL products, for example, um, if you look at a 45 mil thick um, piece of high span, our tolerance there at, at time of manufacture is minus zero plus two. So a, a high span section at the time of leaving us is going to between, be between 45 and 47 in the case of something that's called up as a nominal 45. So it's important that you detail the steel bracket to allow uh, the timber to actually fit. Um, if you've only made a 45 mil space, um, that might become problematic. Of course, using proprietary brackets wherever you can is, is a good idea. Stuff that's off the shelf is, is um, nice and easy. A good example there is Perlin connections. If you can use proprietary connections, that, um, that saves a, a, a lot of cost typically. Um, with respect to column based connections, typically those are, are manufactured. Um, to suit the actual building, um, whether they're folded up from plate or, or welded. So those aren't going to be proprietary, they'd be made to order, but everything else, it makes sense to use proprietary brackets if you can. Again, if you can, sourcing the bracketry from the fabricator together with the LVL as a kit set is a good idea. Um, and again, that, that can help to make sure that these brackets uh, are detailed and, and will fit um, on site. Using an experienced fabricator that is important. And um, during the design process, it's important not just to consider the finished building, but also to consider stresses applied to, to joins, whether they're splices, moment connections. Um, if you're picking these up and doing a bay lift, your stresses can look very different. Um, and um, typically, you know, there's some thought required as to where things are, are lifted from, sling angles, um, heights and, and whatnot, which it makes sense for the structural engineer to do as, as part of the structural design of the building. I think we've well and truly run out of time. So um, these are all case studies that are available on our website anyway. So by all means, go and, go and have a look at those. Um, there's uh, some contact details here. The software is available from our website. Um, 
the 0800 number there goes directly to one of the engineers on my team. So by all means, give us a call with any, any burning questions. And there's an email address there as well. If you wanted to, to send any of those through direct to there, we're, we're happy to help. I think I'll hand it back to you, Demir. Jeremy, that was so extensive and thorough. Thank you very, very much. What a great finale for TDS webinars for 2022. I'm really amazed by the information that you presented today. It's really very good practice, very good information. Uh, a lot of uh, things that uh, engineers are waiting to apply on uh, site and uh, in design. And uh, I don't know, to be honest, I'm really speechless. Uh, what a great effort that you guys have made at L Future Build LVL. Uh, maybe some research, uh, some uh, testing, uh, the software is, uh, itself like uh, getting uh, now more professional. Uh, it will be good like to download uh, by the engineers and try, try it uh, and uh, see uh, how it goes, uh, I don't know. I think we, we better carry on with questions and answers. Thank you very, very much once again, Jeremy. Uh, you made the TDS uh, really very proud today with the information that you presented. I would like to pass on uh, to my colleague, uh, Daniel. Uh, please, Daniel, uh, you carry on with uh, Jeremy, please. Thank you, Namir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Daniel Broder, president of Timber Design Society. And yeah, Jeremy, thank you very much for the presentation. That was very thorough, a, a lot to digest, um, but there's still a few questions and we don't have a lot of time left, uh, if any at all. But I, I have summarized three areas where I wanted to quickly ask you. Uh, one is mainly about the software. Um, there's a couple of questions. I run them through and then maybe you can uh, answer them as we go. Um, one is uh, you mentioned that you can use the software to the draft um, New Zealand uh, timber design standard. Um, is it in fact the draft or is it the final version which has been published uh, just a few weeks back? Good question. Yep. Um, and I have recycled a slide from the TDS Roadshow when it was still in draft form. So yes, it, it does do it to the final standard. Yep. Oh, brilliant. Uh, next question on the software. You obviously mentioned uh, joint design and plywood gussets. Does it also calculate the stiffness of those joints? It doesn't. That, that's something um, something we're, we're looking at at the moment. Um, it does do stiffness for the quick connect moment connection, but, but not for gussets. Um, and, and gussets, of course, varies a little bit. If, if you are glue nailing in the factory, often the glue takes care of a lot of the nail slip involved. Um, so we need to think about how to incorporate that. Um, so I think that's something we, we can expect to put into a future release, but um, it's not in there just yet. That's probably a good, a good addition. And I think the stick portal frame guideline has some uh, allowance for calculating um, the slip of a gusset plate in a, in a very simplified way. Um, Jeremy, another question was, um, can the, the drawing or the sketch or the detail be exported into a CAD software? No, no. So um, I'm assuming that's to do with the, uh, with the gusset design. Um, what we do give you is the coordinates of the corners of um, each successive ring um, and the spacing of the fasteners along that direction. So it's, it's actually pretty quick to, um, to put that onto a drawing, the time-consuming bit is is the uh, the structural calculation. Well, Correct. not not time-consuming using the software, but doing it by hand, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, last two questions on the software. One is: Is the software available in Australia? And the final one is: Does it also do fire or, or, or charring calculations? Uh, so it it does do fire calculations uh, for timber concrete composite floors. We haven't built in fire. Um, there's a few fish hooks in that, probably from a toolkit perspective, but um, it's something that um, that we can certainly look at um, going forward. Um, with, with the Australia query, I don't know that we do anything um, to prevent someone in Australia from downloading it. So that that is there, I guess, on on the same website. Um, 
a lot of the design is done to AS 1720.1. Um, you've just got to be a little bit careful, I guess, when you're when you're using it in a different a different jurisdiction that, that everything's everything's the same. Perfect. Thanks for that. Now the last two questions should be quicker. Um, one engineer is asking or has expressing concerns about durability of LVL, and he's asking what's a reasonable design life for LVL as such. Is it 20 or 30 years? Uh, it's obviously not an easy, like not a straightforward answer, perhaps, but I guess you can, you can give general feedback on that. Yeah, look, I guess it depends on the application. Uh, most of the time, we're designing for a 50-year design life structurally um, for, a, for a structural member. Um, the, the answer there probably varies depending on the environment it's going into um, heavily, but LVL is certainly, um, certainly designable for a 50-year design life and um, included in the relevant durability. So NZS3602, for example, has, uh, has entries for, for LVL for a 50-year design life in, in Table 1. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And perhaps the last one, um, and again, I keep it more generic. There were some questions about cost. Um, are you able to provide some um, generic per cubic meter rate? And or how does LVL compare to other materials? And I guess the question needs to be kept broad in terms of when you compare similar structures, what's your experience um, in terms of cost comparison? Yeah, that's that's a very difficult one to, to answer broadly, I guess. Um, what, what we do find in market is that sometimes the cost of LBL isn't well understood at a quantity surveying level. And, and that's you know common across all timber products, I guess. Um, what we try to do, um, we, we have a preliminary design service that we operate in-house because often at an early stage in a project, people are trying to decide what path to go down but they don't want to invest a lot of time and, and effort in, in designing two buildings, if you like, say one in steel and one in, one in LBL. Um, so the preliminary design there is to, to show people what it would look like. And, and typically we would put that through um, one of the fabricators we work with um, around getting some real costing rather than trying to sort of have an arbitrary cubic metre rate or, or something like that, because it does vary from, from building to building, of course, and depending on what the detailing is. Um, uh, absolutely, and, and I, I kind of knew the question was, wasn't an easy one, but I still thought uh, it, it was important since it's came up several times. Look, yeah. I think um, we leave it here. Uh, maybe, Caitlin, I could ask you to uh, pass on the other questions to Jeremy and he could have a look at them and potentially answer and then they can be sent back to all attendees. And otherwise, obviously, feel free to contact um, Future Build uh, via the email, which is still on the slide. Um, Jeremy, from my side and from the DS committee and all attendees, uh, a big thank you. And there's a lot of other comments uh, which, which go down the same line in thanking you with this great presentation. So thank you very much. Um, this was the last session for the year. We're looking forward to another um, series uh, starting, I think, February next year, January. We're we all going to have a break and we will communicate any new webinar then in due course. So thanks for that and uh, have a good holiday season, everyone. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, everyone.